On tonight's Monday Night Travel, we explore the stunning, steep-sided waterways of Western Norway. Joined by the Paddle Pilgrim, we'll kayak up the magnificent Sonja and Hardanger fjords, appreciating both the natural beauty and the local culture. Thanks for joining us. Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to Monday Night Travel. My name is Ben Green, and I'm excited to pick up a paddle with all of you and our special guest tonight to explore the fjords of Norway. Now, tonight's Monday Night Travel is slightly different from our usual content. We are very fortunate to have Dave Ellingson, an author, professor, speaker, pastor, and paddler here to share his documentary coming home and provide more details on his remarkable experience kayaking the fjords. So please join me in welcoming the Paddle Pilgrim, Dave Ellingson. Hi, Dave. Welcome to Monday Night Travel. Hi, Ben. Good to be with you on a sunny day here in Edmonds. Amazing, isn't it? Oh, beautiful day. Beautiful day. Are you an Edmonds resident? Are you local? I am about two miles from here, up the hill, and um, love the water here. Whenever I can be near water, I'm a happy guy. Yes, yes. I can certainly understand why. Yeah. Now... The name Paddle Pilgrim, what is the story behind that and what does it mean to you? Well, I've been a paddler since I was little, um, but I began when I stepped down from my teaching position at the college and uh, and began to do these longer expeditions. And um, they weren't trips. I know Rick talks about we're not tourists, we're learners on these journeys. And I find it's a pilgrimage and I find it goes to a deeper level of learning um, the world is a classroom. The river is a place that I learn from. And so I get out every chance I get to let the, the waterways in various countries mm -hmm. teach me. You are an inspiration, truly. Oh, thank truly. you. Yeah, and I think many of our fellow travelers will be very inspired tonight by this story in Norway that you have here. And kayaking, Dave, that burns calories, right? So you need food. And we're doing virtual kayaking tonight. So I brought you some food. Yeah. Here we have oh, some traditional goodness. Norwegian pastries. We have the waffles, which yes. you know. Yes. And this, how do you pronounce this? Dietost. It's a goat's uh, cheese. It's mm -hmm. kind of colorful, caramelized uh, cheese on a, a waffle. Very good, isn't it? And and what is this? This is Verdens, Verdens Beste, <laughs> which... Uh, was recommended to me by Scandinavian Specialties in Seattle, a yes. wonderful place to get Scandinavian pastry, chocolate, etc. It is a, well, it literally means the world's best cake, and it's a sponge cake made with meringue and almond, so you can't go wrong. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Well, I'll eat it when the movie's, when, okay. when, the, yes, when, when Coming good. Home is playing, all right? And, you know, actually, Dave, we're going to start out with Rick, because Rick, as you know, has two episodes on Norway and right. has a segment where he beautifully introduces the fjords. So we'll let Rick start things off for us. Excellent. This Rivers of ice like this carved huge valleys, creating the defining feature of Norway's landscape, the fjords. Those glaciers, as much as a mile thick, spent eons carving up Western Norway as they worked their way to the sea. Slowly, they gouged U-shaped valleys that later filled with water. The distance from seabed to mountaintop around here is as much as 9,000 feet, nearly two vertical miles. Dramatic waterfalls continue to cut into the mountains. This viewpoint makes sure car hikers get out and appreciate the view. Sonjafjord is Norway's biggest, and that's the one we're exploring. Of its many arms, the most scenic is called Nerøyfjord. Rain or shine, traditional ferries offer a relaxing yet thrilling fjord experience. These ferries, while popular with tourists, are the lifeline of many fjordside communities. Some remote farms are connected to the outside world only by ferry. Mail is dropped and visitors come and go by request. And the visual highlight of this ride, Nerøyfjord, is 10 miles long and breathtakingly narrow as little as 800 feet wide. Now, Dave, 
we some of that was Norway in a nutshell. Is that correct? It was Norway in a nutshell. Um, you start in um, Gudvangen, which is near Bergen, and you we paddled from there through the Narrow or Narrow Fjord around into the Orlands Fjord. And then we traveled, uh, stopped in a little village called Undradal. And you'll hear the rest of the story on that because it was not just about getting good cheese. It was kind of an epic mm -hmm. adventure. And then to Flom, which is at the other end of the fjord. It's a, on, on, a, on a boat, you can travel around in two or three hours. So it's a must, a must see. If you're in your kayak, it may take you a little bit longer. And when did you go to Norway for this kayaking trip? We we paddled, my team and I paddled back in 2018, mm -hmm. and uh, there were four of us, and we paddled, uh, we chose a time the middle of June mm -hmm. to the middle of July because um, there are less tourists, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of snow still on the mountains, and because there's snow on the mountains, there are waterfalls galore. Near Gudvang, and we could stand and, and turn around, and there were 13 waterfalls that we could see from our kayaks. Unbelievable. Now, the days are particularly long at that time. Was that an issue for sleeping? It was. Uh, the midnight, Norway is sometimes called the land of the midnight sun. Mm -hmm. And so you have basically at least diffuse light, mm -hmm. uh, 24 hours. And so we had to put blinders on at night to be able to sleep in our tents. But uh, we were plenty tired by the end of our day mm -hmm. because we were uh, experiencing all kinds of weather and uh, working hard to earn our sleep. So sleeping wasn't a problem. No, well, that's positive for sure. And Dave, this documentary that you produced coming home, um, I'm curious, did you know that you were going to, to make this ahead of your trip? Well, I um, a number of years ago, I helped to teach a video production course at Pacific Lutheran University out here in Tacoma. And so I had the skills when we went from analog to digital. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a, a matter of resharpening those skills because when I go on these adventures, whether it's the Mississippi River or whether it's the fjords of Norway or recently the Mekong River in Southeast Asia, I take a lot of pictures. Mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of video. And um, I also try to build into a book the complete story. And then the film becomes the sort of the highlights of the adventure. And, and you have a book as well yeah. on this experience. This, and this is available on your website, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I have a copy. I've enjoyed it a lot. Very good. And did you have an intended audience for this documentary? Well, you know, it's interesting. I I, I surprised myself a little bit because each adventure, um, I find that the audience has grown. Um, Norway, of course, I was telling my own story and I was just doing it because I love learning more about my own family. Um, but there's all sorts of Scandinavian cultural groups. And here in the Pacific Northwest, the, the Norwegians who didn't stop in Minnesota and Iowa and Wisconsin and kept coming to where we have mountains and waterfalls mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and became loggers and fishermen. Um, so at the heart of the audience would clearly be the Scandinavian community mm -hmm. across the country because 3 million Norwegians mm -hmm. came in about 50, 60 years to the United States, mm -hmm. half of Norway. So we have a lot of Scandinavians in this country. Um, I also have a large audience of paddlers, uh, mm -hmm. kayakers, canoers. Um, and I was just at an event, Canoe Copia in Madison, mm -hmm. Wisconsin, and, and did a program there. And so the paddling community... But the interesting thing I think that I didn't really anticipate was the the world of uh, genealogy and mm -hmm. family history. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of uh, Finding Your Roots, yep. the PBS program. And I've always been fascinated with my family uh, roots. And so alongside of the paddling and the, the general Norwegian culture and history, um, I was tracing my roots back to the fjords, mm -hmm. the two fjords we paddled were where the lion's share of my family mm -hmm. came in the uh, 1850s to the United States. So I was yeah. I was going home. In fact, the film was called Coming Home. And it's remarkable that even after 100 and, well, 170 years, yes. you still feel that connection. Oh, right? absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I think the phenomenon that Henry Louis Gates has discovered on his show is a lot of people don't know a lot about their families, but have become mm -hmm. curious 
Part of it is the genetic testing. Part of it is we're a country of immigrants, but we've lost our history. Mm -hmm. And I think we're trying to find roots because it, our roots shape who we are. And mm -hmm. so for me, it's helped me to know myself better mm -hmm. and to appreciate my heritage. Yeah. I can certainly relate to that. Yeah. Well, I have many more questions, Dave, but I think I'll let coming home answer some of them and Good. we'll see what our fellow travelers have for questions later on as well in the Q&A. Sometimes we need to go on a journey to find our home. We are all on a journey to find out who we are and where we came from. Something was drawing me to kayak Norway to solve the mystery of my family roots along the fjords. A mystery that started on the old homestead in Iowa. It's called the Driftless. Glaciers from the last ice age missed this region and left behind a landscape of rolling hills and forests and streams. It wasn't like the homeland, but close enough to pause and then stay. This is where my Norwegian relatives settled in the 1850s near Decorah, Iowa. As a boy, when we gathered for family reunions, we had so much fun hiking, and paddling, and fishing, and eating. Uncle Lester knew every good fishing hole in the county and supplied walleye pike for the feasts. And Uncle Hoot, yep, Uncle Hoot, was the storyteller. My favorite tales were about my grandparents, Ole Ellingson and Helen Nesheim. Grandpa Ole juggled a business in town, farms in the countryside, and as county sheriff during Prohibition, kept the peace. Grandma Helen was the quiet matriarch who managed the household, feeding 11 hungry children during the Great Depression and sending them all off to college. Hoot affectionately called them the dear departed because they had each died before I was born. It felt like they were there with us as Hoot spun his yarns. In the 1850s, Ole and Helen's parents left the challenges of farming the rocky hillsides along the fjords of Norway and came to America. They came for a better life. They came for the American dream. What an amazing journey they had gone on across the ocean to come to this place along Canoe Creek. Canoe Creek flows into the upper Iowa River which meanders into the mighty Mississippi River, where Uncle Lester took us fishing. About this time, I read Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, and I began to dream of traveling on a raft down the river someday. That dream came true in 2012 when I launched my kayak from Lake Itasca in northern Minnesota, and for two months I paddled 2,300 miles down Big Muddy to New Orleans. What an adventure. I was hooked. Well, Dave, clearly there's many facets to this trip to Norway, this kayaking expedition. Paramount and central to that is a desire to connect with your Norwegian heritage. I'm curious, just how far in the past did you know that you wanted to make this trip where you combine your interest in family history and your love of paddling? I think we have unconscious desires. In other words, we see a picture of something, maybe people who imagine going on a Rick Steves adventure when they see a picture of some magnificent place, a seed is planted. And over time, I think often germinates. So for me, when we had our family reunions, we'd be eating all this wonderful food and telling stories. And, and I knew everybody was, you know, Norwegian. And one of the great aunts had actually done a family tree getting all the information, not from Google, which didn't exist, but from church records. So she found out the christening, uh, marriages, deaths, and all that, and had like about a 40-page family tree. And I remember reading through that and thinking, wow. And it goes all the way back. Of course, you have to have a family tree back 
to a king of Norway. So we <laughs> traced it to a king and stopped there. <laughs> That's a good place to end. It doesn't get any better than that, I suppose. I, I can appreciate that. Yeah. Well, you mentioned here as well your trip down the Mississippi in 2012, and that was significantly longer. It was two months, and what was it, 2,300 miles? Yes. What made you decide to make that trip, and what were some of the challenges you faced? Well, I was born in Minnesota and lived near the Mississippi River. We'd cross it on bridges, and and I had read Huck Finn as a boy mm -hmm. and knew the stories of Tom Sawyer mm -hmm. and I have always lived on water. Um and I love to be on the water or in the water. And so it was my Huck Finn adventure. And I wanted to see this magnificent, long, long river, which is really kind of the the uh, the nervous system of America. It's, mm -hmm. it's America's main street. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. to experience the people, the cultures, the history uh, along the river over two months was probably the hardest adventure yeah. I've ever been on. But I encountered all sorts of amazing people and, and scenery along the way. So it was unforgettable. And it spurred me on mm -hmm. to more adventures right. in the future. Right. That is remarkable. Yeah. As a boy, my family lived along another river, the Hudson. And I was fascinated by the Erie Canal. Once again, my dream became a reality in 2017 when I launched near Niagara Falls and I paddled the Erie Canal and Hudson River to the Statue of Liberty. Something remarkable was happening on these journeys. I found myself imagining my ancestors as they traveled these same waters on their journey to America. What did my great-grandparents leave behind in Norway? And what's it like today along those fjords? It felt like they were calling out to me, come to Norway, come and paddle. Come and see. And so I began to imagine and plan an adventure in Norway. But rather than paddle solo, I decided to gather a crew of friends. We met up in Minneapolis. Each was a seasoned paddler. Each had Norwegian roots. Each was retired. And each said an enthusiastic, ja, sure, ye betcha, when I invited them to be a part of our Spirit of Norway team. Jim had paddled the Mississippi, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, and as an engineer is a great detail guy. Ellen was the first woman to solo paddle the Mississippi and is a gifted artist who creates remarkable paintings and drawings. Brent has paddled the Missouri Breaks, does drone videography, and was once a rock and roll drummer. And I am Dave, pastor, professor, paddler, poet who dreams big dreams and loves adventures. This is a great quote, by the way, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Now, Dave, you didn't have any fellow paddlers for your trips down the Mississippi and Hudson, but you decided to get a posse together, a like-minded posse for this trip in Norway. What made you decide to do that? Well, um, I had gotten to know these other paddlers. The paddling community mm -hmm. is a very interesting group. And, and I had heard of these people. And they had actually, Jim had helped me in the early going on my Mississippi journey. Um, Ellen is, is famous in the paddling world because uh, she paddled the whole Mississippi uh, and painted her way down the river doing drawings and painting, wrote a wonderful book called One Woman's River. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we needed we needed a drone operator, camera operator. And Brent, <laughs> besides being a rock and roll drummer, did the drone videography, which I think was really, really important when we when we were trying to get the panoramas, the yeah. big vistas yeah. in, in the fjord country. So some of his drone footage is in this documentary. Yes. Indeed. Yes, yeah, yes. that's excellent. Yeah. So you all contributed in various ways to this production. Yeah. Well, I mean... It, like life, I like to think that life is a collaborative effort, mm -hmm. that group mm -hmm. wisdom is always better. And when you're in challenging circumstances, having different voices and perspectives and skills makes the journey more fun yeah. and uh, probably safer and mm -hmm. uh, just a, a better adventure. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Well, let's take a closer look at the routes that you paddled.
And so we took off. Our grand plan was to paddle for one month on my two ancestral fjords. Two weeks on the Sogna or Sun Fjord, and two more weeks on the Hardanger Fjord, with our final destination, the Nesheim family farm near Granvin, that my relatives left to come to America over 150 years ago. How did you come to select these two routes? Well, um, as I said, my ancestors, many of them came from those fjords. And um, I wanted to see what was it like along the fjords. I knew they had been farmers, um, that they came in this massive immigration. Um, and I wanted to find out what the, the farm was like. I had never been to the farm, but I just wanted to see what I think is the most beautiful part of the world, the fjord country of Norway. Um, anybody that I know who's been there describes it as the most beautiful area in the world. And and the people are very friendly and uh, the food, which we're sampling, <laughs> is is very delicious with a, abundant quantities of sugar and cinnamon and almonds and butter. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yes. <laughs> and, and yeah. Yeah. It's giving me the energy that I need at this moment, in fact. But Dave, you know, you only talk so much about the preparations you right. took. Right. I was wondering if you could give us a, a little bit more insight into what you needed to do to make this happen. Well, on several fronts. First of all, we had to make sure we had good equipment. Um, and we rented from an outfitter, Nordic Ventures in Goodvangen. I highly recommend uh, them. We also got help from Njord Kayaks in Flom. And part of it was the equipment, which they supplied at a very reasonable cost. Um, they actually transported us between mm -hmm. a couple of the fjords, mm -hmm. which was very, very helpful. Um, and so... Equipment was the first thing. I knew enough about Norway and the areas. So it was more a matter of trying to get to those specific places that that my family had been from. And so th then there's the getting in shape for the journey. Mm -hmm. Some people wondered, did you have to work out a lot? Well, I I was a marathon runner and a 100-mile mm -hmm. runner and triathlete. So I'm generally in pretty good shape. But I, I don't think that should keep people from paddling. Mm -hmm. Frankly, the, the line I often use is the river gets you in shape. Yeah. In other words, you start out paddling because you really can't simulate paddling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you paddle and you paddle a little bit. And then each day you add miles and you get more in shape. And, um, you know, you have a good beverage at the end of the day to celebrate what you've accomplished and, and reduce whatever pain there might be. Yeah, no, very good tip. <laughs> and that Outfitter Nordic Ventures, we've linked to them in the chat. So anyone good. who's interested in looking them up and possibly creating their own uh, paddle experience in Norway, it'll also be in the follow-up email that goes. And, and you don't have to paddle for a month mm -hmm. like we did. They will rent a kayak for a half a day. Yeah. They have guided tours that were four or five days. They, they With their guided tours, they have seasoned veterans. They bring along wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful food. They know the camping sites. So you don't have to do what we did to experience um, Norway in a kayak. No. I've never, you know, I love kayaking, Dave, but I've never done it on a trip. Right. Why not? And it's my next plan, to say the least. I'm going to make it happen. Good. It was raining when we arrived in Gudvangen. After a damp night in our tents, we were greeted by a cloudy morning. But a paddler arrived to let us know this was the very best weather because you paddle in the clouds and it's magical. The sun soon melted the clouds and we were savoring the rugged beauty of the Neroy Fjord. We found a spectacular campsite near Deerdal along a rushing stream. Jet lagged and paddle weary, we were ready for sleep. That first night, how did you feel, Dave? Were you anxious? How did it, how did that first night compare to your previous trips the first night? On every one of my adventures, the first night is largely sleepless. Um I just I went through all the preparations. I had, I was the leader. I wanted to make sure it went well. You just, you, you can only prepare so much and then you're sort of at the mercy of the elements. Um, also it was the midnight sun. So we were getting used to the fact that it was light. Mm -hmm. And we learned later that we had camped along this river 
in the midst of a um, rookery for mm. seagulls. <laughs> and so they were dive bombing us. We we went back there later on our trip and found a better location for them. And by that time, the new chicks had hatched. And so the I, I was not sleeping real well, but I got a great uh, time lapse photography, mm -hmm. which you'll see in a moment here of the sun mm -hmm. uh, on the sun field. Well, you can't prepare for the birds, I think, right? Yeah, there's only so much you can do, as you said. About 4 a.m., I awoke in my tent to the roar of the nearby stream, squawking seagulls, and the persistent light of the midnight sun. But it was more than that. My mind was racing, a million thoughts. Why am I doing this? Can I do this? I wondered if my great-grandfather had the same fears when he began his journey to America. What happened next took our breath away. Sunrise on the Sun Fjord. After a day hiking up the glacier carved valley, we met Bjarne and Ranve. I started calling the people who helped us along the way our Fjord Angels. They invited us to share a snack of heart-shaped waffles. It was time we got back on the water, and the weather was cooperating as we launched. But how could a place of such peace and beauty change so quickly? Soon we were battling headwinds and waves bouncing and ricocheting off the cliffs, 2,000-foot cliffs and water was seeping into my spray skirt. It was cold, icy water. And I was paddling in circles, and I finally yelled out to Brent, Brent, come and check my rudder. So he came over, and he came alongside, and he said, it's broken. So I paddled furiously into a little tiny cove and dried off, and there was a Norwegian couple there, and they said, go rudderless. I thought, of course, my broken rudder was taking me around in circles. And so I returned to the water rudderless, and without a broken wing, I continued to paddle to Undredal and on later to flow. That must have been pretty impactful. Were you concerned? Were you nervous, Dave, losing your rudder? Well, I didn't lose it. It actually broke. Uh -huh. But the rudderless part, when I began paddling, I didn't have rudders. And, you know, Native Americans and indigenous people in their kayaks don't have rudders. They just paddle well and right. <laughs> so I had to relearn what I had learned before, and I was fine. I was fine. But it's a little unnerving because there was big water, and you'll see a little bit of that in the water breaking over the bow of my boat. And, and I had three friends along who could help me. So, yes, I was concerned. But... I, the, the the kayak company then, um, within a, a matter of several hours, uh, replaced my kayak. So I had a yeah. great service from them. Fantastic. Yeah. Did you notice that it was more difficult for you to kayak than your three travel companions because you your rudder was broken or, at that point, or was it okay? Well, I, it, when you when you paddle rudderless, you're doing more corrections. Okay. When you have a rudder, it it stabilizes and you can paddle a straighter line. So. Um, but they were very forgiving and gave me a bad time, which they did all <laughs> along with, come on, keep up with us. <laughs> but we made it just fine. Yeah, yeah very good. <laughs> There's a deeper lesson here. With the help of our next Fjord Angels, Daniel and Marta and Irvin from Njord Kayaks, we made our way to a campground in an ancient apple orchard. It may be called the Sun Fjord, but the rain and wind persisted the next day. So we toured the tiny village of Flom, and in the evening caught the electric train up into the mountains to Myrdal. The next stop is the waterfall. One moment we were cursing the wind and the water and the waves, and the next all we could say was, wow, as we viewed a wonderland of waterfalls. I told Ellen as we got off the train, I sprained my wow. 
With a dire forecast of severe weather, our outfitters took us by road and ferry to Balastrand to create a base camp for future paddling. On the way along the fjord that was windswept with white caps, Irvin, our outfitter, warned us about the weather and Willowas. Willowas? What is that? Willowas are winds that would sweep down from the mountain valleys into the fjords with such force they could snap the paddle out of your hands and capsize your kayak. We began to wonder, was this journey really a good idea? Our destination, Balastrand, turned out to be a quaint village with a long history as a gathering place for artists, drawn by spectacular scenery, illumined by an almost magical light. I'm a paddler and I'm an artist, and that's who I truly am. The lighting here is completely, is totally different than what I'm used to. It's more subdued and it's just, um, there's a richness in the colors here. During a break in the weather, we enjoyed paddling outside Balastrand on the Fjörlands Fjord with farms and villages perched on rocky hillsides. Perfect paddling conditions. The surface was like glass. Our kayaks drifted and we soaked up the surroundings. But we had learned by now that in Norway you can experience four seasons in a day. The rain and a cold wind returned, and so we rented a small cabin in Balastrand. And for several days, we waited. We had a lot of time on our hands, waiting for the weather to turn. So we pondered, we studied the maps, we debated our options, we walked, we went to the St. Olaf Kirke, and I said a special prayer for guidance. And we stayed close to shore. The wait was getting frustrating, but it slowly dawned on us. We were on vacation. Unlike our previous journeys, we were not an expedition with goals of many miles to paddle each day. Like those childhood family reunions, our spirit of Norway goal was fun, enjoyment, savoring the place, the people, and the culture. We had to pause to remember. After several days, the rain stopped and the most beautiful rainbow promised better paddling ahead. Dave, it sounds like you had a rough route in mind, but were flexible. Is that true? That's the nature of any kind of outdoor adventure. Um, you have to be flexible. The phrase go with the flow came from somewhere, mm -hmm. probably on some kind of mm -hmm. adventure like this. And so, yeah, we had to adjust our schedule. And, um, you know, the the a great place to to enjoy is Balastron. And I have a, a Rick Steves story related to Balastron. Um, we were eating freeze-dried and dehydrated food most of the time, which gets a little old after a while. But there was a restaurant in town called the Vikinger Treff. And so we went there for dinner one night. It had been recommended to us. And when we got to the door... Um, there was a, a little poster with a picture of Rick Steves on it. And it was a review from one of his books recommending Corolla is the name of the gal. In, and I think her picture will come up in a little bit. But um, she, the story behind it really quickly is she um, had, she's from Vienna and she made really good sausage. And she had a cart where the, the boats came in. And Rick fell in love with her sausage <laughs> and recommended it in his travel books. And so I think maybe it was maybe three years later, she had made enough money selling sausage <laughs> to open her restaurant. So I took a picture of Corolla and me and I texted Rick and said, Rick, this is really good news and the food is wonderful. And she was very appreciative of that. So those are the kinds of things you can't plan on and are just the delights of a pilgrimage or an adventure. 
um, particularly mm -hmm. in Norway, was special. Yeah, a little spontaneity goes a long way. Absolutely. And for changing your plans, for example, with that broken rudder, you were able to call the outfitter Nordic Ventures and they were able to help you. Yes. Um, was that, ex did you know that, that, that they were available? Is that extra? Because they rent you the kayak. And we had one fee for our adventure, and that took care of everything. Now, the only thing that we added for Njord uh, and one other experience with uh, Nordic Ventures was um, when they transported our kayaks between mm -hmm. some of the fjords. Mm -hmm. But they loaded all of our kayaks onto a rack behind a truck. We headed over. It was like 100 bucks or 150 mm -hmm. bucks. So it wasn't really expensive, and they were very flexible. I think they were kind of intrigued because... They had never had a group like <laughs> us. Usually they'd have people sign up for their five-day trips yeah. or three-day trips. And they were just intrigued to see if we'd survive. <laughs> and I think they had a vested interest in our surviving. But they were very kind, very generous. So they, they kept a special <laughs> eye on you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. <laughs> With revised plans, we prepared to finally leave Balastrand and launch again. A nine-mile paddle across the widest stretch of the Sun Fjord. Our spirits were high and humor had returned as Jim and Brent waited for the tide to come in so we could get going. Jim had forgotten how to paddle, so he had to practice a bit. Sometimes I have laughed so hard on this trip that the next morning my stomach hurts. <laughs> what began with calm water and laughter changed quickly into a white knuckle experience in the widest part of the fjord. I almost capsized trying to use my GoPro camera. It was like being in a Hans Dahl painting. I tried to summon up the courage of my Viking ancestors, and I thought about my great-grandmother, who was only 17 years old when she sailed to America. Keep paddling, Dave. And save us, St. Olaf. We were relieved to reach the safe and protected harbor in the hamlet of Vik. After drying off and warming up, we were transported back across the mountains to the Neroy Fjord. The weather forecast was promising with warmer days and less wind, and we were returning to sheltered waters. Nine miles in a kayak, Dave, that's a significant distance, isn't it? Well, here in Edmonds, if you were to leave our dock down here and go across to the island, that's about nine, 10 miles. So you have a, a, a comparison, but sure it was. And it was made difficult by the wind coming up and blowing us. And there was no way with our different strokes, we could stay together. So we were, I was kind of keeping an eye on everybody and we all got over there, but Ellen wasn't there. Mm. And I thought, well, where's Ellen? And so we all stood on the beach, just waiting for her kayak to appear. And it did, but we were soaking wet. We were cold and we were glad that, um, the kayak company came and hauled us across the mountains to return to our favorite fjord, which is the Neroy Fjord. Mm -hmm. it, did you have an emergency plan if the weather became too severe, the water became too rough? Would you just go to shore as quickly as you could and take it from there? Or Yeah, you listen to the weather. You listen mm -hmm. to your bodies and, and, and your bodies and the weather and the water will tell you. But you can't always tell with the weather, because as I said earlier, um, you can have four seasons in one day and they can change very rapidly. So you, you have to be careful. And that was another reason why I was glad to have three paddling partners because we could kind of keep a watch and help each other out. Would you say that this was a fairly risky venture or just with proper precaution, checking the weather expected for the day, et cetera, it's, it's okay? Well, I, I always am, I'm not cautious, but I'm mm -hmm. cautious for other people. So I think if people go and wanted to do something like this on the fjords, they should sign up for one of the, the outfitters mm -hmm. tours because mm -hmm. then they have guides. Um, we were a little bolder because we had paddled long distances and yeah. big conditions. And the kayak company said, you're going to do what? Mm -hmm. And we did. And they sort of made an exception for us. 
-hmm. So I caution people on any kind of adventure, if it's of several days, even experienced people, if it's in a new place, mm -hmm. um, learn from the locals whenever it's possible. I want to go back to Norway and paddle way up in the north in the Lofoten Islands yeah. and the spectacular area. And I was I saw a workshop recently at this big canoe paddle event. And the guy that led the workshop, which I attended, um, he hired uh, an outfitter mm -hmm. because you're in you're in ocean water yeah. there. Right. So when I do that, we're going to hire a guide because he knows the islands really, really mm -hmm. well. And so you have to take each each situation. But I, one of my mottos is paddle boldly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. taking a, a risk and a challenge is a great way to um, to stretch yourself. Yeah, very true. Very true. And great drone footage here once yeah. again. Yeah. A short paddle up the fjord, we found a fabulous campsite. The views were breathtaking. It was unreal. Right now I'm working on, I'm drawing a sketch of the little hamlet that's across the fjord. Then in the background is, is the very dramatic lighting of the fjord and the softness of the water in the foreground. For several days, we enjoyed shorter paddles and hikes as we explored this new home. One afternoon, when we returned to camp after a short paddle, it appeared our home had been invaded by a fleet of kayaks. As we approached, we learned that they were young adults with handicapping conditions, riding in tandem kayaks with guides, their own fjord angels. We were deeply inspired by these exceptional paddlers. Ellen presented Jan, their leader, with one of our Spirit of Norway patches. As we sat around the campfire one evening, Ellen shared how much she loved paddling and camping because she has her home on her back like a turtle. She has all her needs, she's traveling light, she can enjoy and be fully present to the natural world and everything she encounters. Well, this method of travel, Dave, for one month provides no doubt such a different perspective than a land-based itinerary. Can you describe maybe a little bit of the advantages of experiencing these fjords from the water? I think of John Muir, one of my heroes, when he walked all around uh, the the west and one of his favorite things was to climb up into a tree during a storm to be near the storm another one was he went uh, to yosemite and he got crawled up in the rocks behind the falls because he wanted to experience the falls and so when i'm paddling i'm feeling like i'm almost one with the water or whether it's a waterfall getting down beneath it you're 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 not rushing to the next spot you mm -hmm. can just be completely present and savor and, and let it sink in in ways that i can't i don't even have words to express but uh, it, it transforms you body mind and spirit and that's that's what i've learned by paddling and being on these adventures on the water you're close to nature you're at the mercy of the elements it, it's a humbling experience which a lot of us could probably learn in this mm -hmm. day and age of rancorous debate and yelling and that humility goes a lot further in our adventures. And I would imagine that, you know, some of these towns in high season in the Sonia Fjord in particular, Norway in a nutshell, they're very busy. And this is a great way to escape the crowds, right? No, very few people are doing this. So in these crowded places, I can't think of a better way to have some peace. Yes, yes. And, and there's a, a Norse concept um, the, the word is alamens retten, which means all men's or all persons right mm -hmm. um, or or the freedom to travel. Mm -hmm. So you can camp anywhere you want. Mm -hmm. Now, there are rules. You let the landowner know um, you stay for out of view of their house or their farm um, and you can stay for three days. Mm -hmm. So we observe that freedom to roam, which is a very Nordic concept. Um, there is some private property in Norway, not to, not to say it isn't true, 
But this freedom to roam, I think, captures the Nordic spirit yeah. in a wonderful way. And we didn't have to worry about hotels and making making places on time. It's like, well, I think the wind is blowing out of the Northeast. I hope we can get there in the next two or three hours. Right, yeah. right. And Sweden and Finland have similar policies, I know, as well. And right. um, I think that that speaks to their emphasis on public space, yes. right, which is a wonderful thing. That's right. It was hard to leave the rugged beauty of the Neroy Fjord, but it was now time to paddle the Hardanger Fjord where my ancestors farmed for centuries. We immediately saw very different terrain with more farms and orchards on the hillsides. The weather was warming and paddling conditions were improving as the fjord was widening. An absolutely gorgeous day. Wonderful, wonderful day to be on the water. Our conversations were growing deeper. We shared what we were learning. We could be honest with our feelings. It's challenging. It's, it's challenging me in a lot of different ways as far as doing things outside my comfort zone, sleeping in a tent for a month, sleeping bag, but not to take anything away from all of this. It's beautiful here. We had all been drawn to this place. Norway is a place of fierce and spectacular beauty. It's a beauty that invites and draws you in and begins to shape you. Home is place. Jim first heard about Norway in a fifth grade world geography class. He remembered pictures of fjords with mountains that started at sea level, then stretched and stretched into the heavens. It tugged at his heart. For him, this trip was truly a dream come true. Over and over again, we said, wow, as we paused and beheld the three Fs, fjord, fjell, fossen, water, mountains, waterfalls. Water, mountains, waterfalls, stunning. You know, I might have the opportunity to go to the Sonia Fjord in August, Dave, and I'll definitely be thinking of you when I go. Well, and, and you're going to get on the water, right? You're we'll going to paddle? We'll see if I have the time. I will try. Well, I think that would be a required, a must. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to seeing your pictures and hearing your tall tales afterwards. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll definitely share them for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just incredible. Yeah. And we were reminded that in all our adventures, it's about the people, the fjord angels, those good folks who welcome us, take care of our needs, and inhabit the place with their customs and history and hospitality. Home is people. And now as we approached Granvin, I was excited to meet my people on the family farm near Nesheim. As we approached the family farm, I felt welcome. The ground, the land, the water, it was just so beautiful and I felt like literally I had come home. When I called out, I'm a Nesheim, Erling and Helga immediately invited us with a welcomen. And we sat for an hour or two and it was like, I'd come home and I was with family. We immediately began talking, sharing stories, laughing. We gathered on their deck to look in the book of family history. And we found great grandpa Johannes name in the list of family members who had gone to America. We had just met, but it felt like I had known them all my life. You are so right, Dave, to mention people as one of the great joys of travel, perhaps the greatest joy. And with this method of, of travel, uh, paddling on the fjords, 
my initial thought was, oh, you're not going to meet that many people. What would you say to that? It seems like you met a fair number of folks anyway. I think it depends on the situation. Sometimes you meet a lot of people. You'll have you could have a day or two where you don't see any people and you're just camping. And for for me, that's fine too. I mean, I like quiet. I think mm -hmm. we live in a noisy world, and so having a peaceful campsite on a beautiful fjord. I mean, if I could pick my last spot on Earth when I <laughs> breathe my last breath. <laughs> a quiet view of the fjord would be really nice. But then you have relatives like like the my Nesheim relatives, you have those those exceptional paddlers that that group of handicapped young people mm -hmm. paddling with um with their own fjord angels, a uh, people who, you know, they were in tandem kayaks mm -hmm. and they were out for a 3-day camping trip and and some of the handicaps were severe so that literally they had to be carried over the shoulder mm -hmm. in the campsite so that they could take care of business. Mm -hmm. But I just, th those were heroic figures and we couldn't have planned that. At first I was mad, they took our camping site. Yeah. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is this is an, something I'll never forget. No, yeah, yeah, right, right. Have you contacted your relatives? The no. times here ahead? So you no. just strolled in and- well, I knew, I knew the area. Mm -hmm. And I knew enough stories from others, but no, I hadn't contacted them. There was something a little bit fun about mm -hmm. that. And I literally, as we were riding electric bikes from our campsite mm -hmm. in Grandin, and we rode the electric bikes out into the countryside and I got to Nesheim, you know, that's mm -hmm. where the family farm I knew was. And so I kept asking people along the road, um, are there any Nessheims? Oh yeah, the, it's the yellow house up the road. And so we kept going up the road and then I yelled, I'm a Nessheim. And the early came, he said, oh, come up, come up. And so we had wonderful apple juice from their orchard and we sat and had cookies and told stories. And um, they want my wife and I to come back and stay in the original, mm -hmm. not original, but the, the oldest of the farm mm -hmm. houses, on, which is just down the hill from their lovely modern mm -hmm. home. So yeah, that no, they didn't know we were coming. And so that's the risk you take. That is so special though. <laughs> what a memory, you know, I'll have to look up my family names and go out and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> give, give it a try. Yeah. And of course it's Norway. So the level of English is very high. Yes. Which helped a lot, I'm sure. Yes. Every every Norwegian has 10 years of school English. Mm -hmm. um, and so, except for very old people who cling to the language and, and really don't want to mm -hmm. speak in English because they're uncomfortable, you can talk to anybody and their English is very good. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Ultimately, it's about the spirit of Norway. Home is spirit. What the locals called free luftsliv, or fresh air life. You know, you're indoors, you're outdoors, you're with people, you're celebrating, you're hiking, you're climbing, you're paddling, you're breathing deeply, you are alive. It's what I experienced long ago by the waters of Canoe Creek on the family farm in Iowa. When we are alive, we see angels all around us, a cloud of witnesses. And maybe most of all, we can encounter the ancestors who I never met in person, but who called me and guided me on this journey. Long ago, I wondered if my great-grandparents were ever homesick for Norway. And I wondered what I'd discover when I went to the family farm. I now have some answers. I sat by the fjord one evening, and I wrote this letter. Dear Grandma, As I sit beside this natal fjord, I think of great-grandpa Johannes. But most of all, of you, Grandma Helen. I wonder if you ever dreamed of your native land. Even though you were born in America and it became your home, did you wonder what your home was like on the Hardanger Fjord as you put on your native dress, the Bunad, and made lefsa and rumagrut and krumkaka? 
As I traverse these holy waters, I have come to feel a deep connection with and a care for this place that was once home to my family. In a very profound way, it is becoming home to me. Home is where the heart is. I am home, Grandma, and I wish you were here. Your grandson, Dave. Thank you. Manga talk. Dave, you know, the two things that make me feel most alive are travel and being in nature. Mm -hmm. And you've combined those so beautifully here. I am deeply inspired. Thank you so much for taking the time to share this incredible experience with us. Well, as they say, a bell de common, you're welcome. <laughs> and and I, I hope it spurs you on in your guiding, your paddling, your traveling, and, and the stories that you will um, experience and share I think can have a, a transformative effect. Thank you so much. And I think that we have many other folks here who were deeply inspired as well. How can you not be? Uh, and we have many questions actually from our fellow travelers tonight. But first I will give a brief word from our sponsor because our bags are not on sale very often, but they are on sale right now, 20% off until March 24th, online at ricksteves.com and in our Edmonds Washington Travel Center which is where we are, mm -hmm. where we are at this moment. And, you know, there's nothing, oh, basically nothing more important than a lightweight but roomy bag that serves you well during your trip. And we have a whole assortment of them, and I've enjoyed using them for many years. So do come visit us either online or in person through March 24th. Those bags are 20% off. Okay, Dave. Emily has been corralling the questions for me. Susan asks, does one have to be an expert swimmer? Um, well, it depends on what you're wearing. Mm -hmm. If you, you're always going to have a personal flotation device, a life check, a PFD. So that's, mm -hmm. that's required. Uh, I was a lifeguard and taught swimming, but I always have a PFD on mm -hmm. no matter what. Oftentimes we were wearing wetsuits mm -hmm. on the fjords mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the water was so cold and, the water down here that I walked by this afternoon, um, I often sometimes in the winter when I paddle in the winter mm -hmm. have a dry suit. Mm -hmm. But for most people, if you have a PFD, that's good. Um, if you're paddling in nice weather, you should be fine. But the fjords don't get much warmer than about 55 degrees. So we had dry suits and we wore them a few times when we had long stretches. Mm -hmm. um, but Safety is is paramount and doing your weather forecasting, having good equipment is very important. So if you work with an outfitter, they'll make sure you have all that stuff. And if you're just a, a casual paddler, still get good equipment and uh, be careful. And you know, that this tip about outfitters, it, I wouldn't have ever known about right. this actually. That is, that is essential. Yeah, that's great. Lisa asks, what is the protocol of someone capsized? <clears throat> well, um, we didn't, thankfully. Um, there are several ways to rescue people. Uh, there's individual rescues. There are team rescues or, or partner rescues. Um, but how do you learn those? You go to a clinic, a paddle club, and they practice them in the winter in a swimming pool. So I learned all that stuff and fortunately haven't had to use them much um, by practicing them in a nice warm swimming pool. <laughs> so so if you're planning um, paddling, I think I think this is wise for anybody that's going to do any paddling. 
either join a paddle club because then you'll have paddling friends to paddle with. Um, and you also get some basic training and learn safety practices and, and rescues because, mm -hmm. the, and I, I look at the videos, you can go online mm -hmm. and you can find anything, including res good rescue techniques. And I ever, whenever I go on a new adventure, I always look at the videos. I look at them again. It's like, I, I think I would do it, but I want to make sure I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So repetition, repetition, repetition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very important. We have a question from Jim. He would like to know if, and this is a quote, an old man like himself can kayak like you. Well, I uh, turned 76 last uh, December. I don't know how old Jim is, but um, I try to take good care of my body. And um, I have a good friend who just paddled and set a new record on the Mississippi, who is 87. Mm -hmm. And he paddled it in 87 days. Mm -hmm. And there's a movie that's just come out. I was My film was at a film festival. And it won the top award at the film festivals. Um, and his name is Dale Sanders. So if you Google Dale Sanders, the ancient voyager or the ancient mariner, you'll see you'll be able to see his adventures. And he's going strong at 87. Wow, that is incredible. Yeah. That's the goal, isn't it? Well, <laughs> to keep going. And then I, I've decided that my final paddle won't be in a camp by the fjord it'll i'll take my kayak and i'll put on it it'll be sunset and i'm going to put dried pine boughs um, mm -hmm. across it mm -hmm. and i'm going to paddle off into the sunset and i'll have a friend shoot a flaming arrow into my kayak and that's the way i'm going to go out hmm. <laughs> you were with me on that one <laughs> until you? 